What's up everybody? I'm Dr. Jordan Taylor, Undergraduate Exercise Science Program Director and Associate Teaching Professor at the University of Kansas. On today's episode of Fitness Facts, I'm excited to have Dr. Quincy Johnson in studio to discuss strength and conditioning program design fundamentals for mixed martial arts athletes. Dr. Johnson is an assistant professor in the Department of Health, Sport, and Exercise Sciences at the University of Kansas, and he's a member of the Jayhawk Athletic Performance Laboratory. He received his bachelor's degree in exercise science from Midland University and his master's and doctoral degrees in health and human performance from Oklahoma State University. Dr. Johnson's research interests focus on optimizing athletic performance, developing physiological profiles to support training and return to play approaches, long-term athletic development, and training load monitoring. These interests have led to professional roles within high school, collegiate, professional, and private athletic settings. In addition to his scholarly activity, Dr. Johnson has been an active strength and conditioning coach working with athletes from professional to peewee levels of sport. Most recently, he served as the director of Loper Performance at the University of Nebraska Kearney and the director of strength and conditioning at Kearney Combat Sports. Dr. Johnson is an active member of the National Strength and Conditioning Association and American College of Sports Medicine. He holds certifications from the NSCA as a certified strength and conditioning specialist with distinction, a certified personal trainer with distinction. He also has certifications through USA Weightlifting, Functional Movement Systems, and the International Society of Performance Analysis of Sport. Additionally, he currently serves as the vice chair of the NSCA's Powerlifting Special Interest Group, and he's on the board of directors for the International Association of Strength and Conditioning. Welcome to the show, Dr. Johnson. I bet you feel like you need eight arms with all that going on, man. <laughs> Gosh, that's a lot. <laughs> so mixed martial arts is a full contact combat sport based on uh, striking, grappling, ground fighting, incorporating techniques from various combat sports from around the world. And many physical characteristics make up a great martial artist. So just for those of you that aren't familiar with the sport of MMA or mixed martial arts, you know, there's an image up here, this, this picture on the screen, obviously Forrest Griffin, Griffin there, you see a great, great strike. Uh, I think that's Quentin Rampage Jackson in the upper right-hand quarter uh, with, with the takedown there. Uh, you know, there's many, it's just gotten big with women. There's a lot of uh, female mixed martial artists now, so you see that kick there. And then I got to give out a shout out in the, in the lower right hand corner to my buddy, um, Austin Osmosis Jones. He's out in Denver. Uh, looks like he's applying that rear naked chokehold there. Um, so Austin, again, uh, close, very close, I think, to cracking into UFC. Obviously, that's the ultimate goal. But again, this sport has just rose in popularity since the early 90s. I think, what was it, like 1993 was the first UFC. Yep. Now, there was hardly any rules back then. I mean, you could... It was pretty much no holds bar. You get in the cage, you do whatever. I mean, they could even like, you could even do like a soccer kick when somebody was down on the ground, <laughs> kick him in the head. There was no weight classes back then. Just fight. So yeah, now it's all you know weight classes. There's there's rules. There's things you can't do. But um, it's become a a huge sport. Um, and, and just to talk about some of the characteristics, if you think about it, like well, what makes up a great fighter, a mixed martial artist? Um, I, and I have a list here. I mean. Obviously, a well-rounded skill set that's specific to the sport. You need to be able to strike, so, you know, punch, kick, um, knees, grappling. So, you know, wrestling, working on the ground, uh, learning various submission holds and submission techniques. You need great muscle strength and, and, muscle, and muscle endurance. Also, some cardiovascular endurance. Uh, the ability to produce power, so that's uh, explosive strength, if you will, right? Power is a product of, of force times velocity. So you need to be strong to produce a lot of force, but you need to produce that force quickly, a lot of speed, a lot of velocity. And rate of force development. Can you produce a lot of force in a short amount of time? This is all, these are all components of, of being explosive and you know, throwing powerful strikes. Um, flexibility, mobility, speed and agility, quick reflexes, a fast reaction time, good hand-eye coordination, timing and accuracy with your strikes. Um, good center of gravity, so core strength and balance. A good reach, which obviously some of us are born with a, a better reach than others, right? <laughs> you and I don't have the best reach being short and stocky, but that helps. A high pain tolerance, you know, so <laughs> Mike Tyson once said, you know, everybody's got a plan until you get punched in the face. Well, you better be able to, to tolerate some pain if you're going to get into the octagon or the ring and participate in mixed martial arts. Uh, and then also just the ability to recover quickly from injuries. 
and um, and manage body weight and body composition, which I'm sure you're going to talk about. Because if, if you're a fighter, a mixed martial artist, there's no real in season, off season. You got to be ready all the time. You know, you may take on a card out of nowhere, fight card, and you got to be ready. So maintaining that weight, that body comp, and, and being in, in your best physical shape year round, as, as I know you'll talk about, is, is important. So that's why I'm going to bring in Dr. Johnson. Um, move on to the second question. So what have you learned from working as a strength and conditioning coach for MMA fighters? Well, yeah, thanks for having me on. I think the biggest thing or the greatest thing that I've learned is to keep the main thing, the main thing. Fighters need to fight, right? They need to be available to train, to prepare for fights. Um, so keep it simple, as simple as, pos as possible. Um, there's also a few other things right outside of that, but if you can make sure to keep the main thing, the main thing, right? Strength conditioning is just a supplement to their training, just right. a supplement to their athletic career, then that will take the strength conditioning coach very, very far, right? Yeah. Um, so that that's that. And then making sure to understand the demands of competition, understanding um, the fighter's strengths, understanding their weaknesses, understanding their style, the way they like to fight, um, understanding the coach's approach and their philosophy, because it's all tied into um, rolling out the best fighter. Yeah, and you, you probably see with a lot of individuals that get into MMA, I mean, they have interesting, they have varied backgrounds, right? So some of them may have been a wrestler in high school, but they, you know, they're not the greatest striker. They, they may not know any you know, Muay Thai or other martial arts. So they try to learn that and add that into their wrestling background. Or maybe they were a football player. Mm -hmm. I know I've talked to other coaches and, uh, you know, people that work with, with MMA athletes. And a lot of them will say, yeah, if you had a background in football, which you did, I, I know I did as well. It's like that lends itself to a lot of times doing very well at MMA. My buddy, Austin Osmosis Jones, he was a football player in Nebraska, had that background and, you know, usually football players are naturally explosive and, mm -hmm. and they've got that speed and agility and powerful athletes. So the, the background of the sports, but they come from other sports, too. I mean, it's really yeah. interesting when you look at the fighters you worked with um, and, and, and fighters that I see in the UFC and Fury and these other, um, uh, you know, associations. It, it, the background is really, really interesting. And I think with you, and I know you're going to talk about this when we get into some of our slides um, you are focused on the strength and conditioning end of it. Yes. And yeah. like you said, it's very hard. There's so many variables that they need in the octagon or ring, like muscle strength, mm -hmm. being powerful, the endurance, the flexibility, mobility, all these things you can work on. And you have to work on those different domains because that's those different domains comprise the sport and being a good fighter. But they still need to spend – it's got to be balanced with all the time they spend on the technical work, Yes. their footwork, the striking, the grappling, the submission hold technique. I mean, there's just so much that goes into it. And it's like, how do you balance all this? I mean, it's a lot of time during the week. Um, so maybe that leads into the next question. What should be prioritized in a strength and conditioning program for MMA athletes? And maybe how do you balance the strength and conditioning aspect, what you're doing with them, with what you know other coaches are doing, working on their technique and getting ready for the fight actually in the octagon? Yeah. Um I think everyone, every strength coach has their own approach and they kind of prioritize different things. For me, my kind of northern star, my guiding light, my shining light for programming and approaching um, training MMA athletes, number one, health and well-being for the athlete. If your athlete is not healthy, if they are not well, if they have a past medical history that is going to limit what they can do, right? Even in training, like training is so intense and they have to train consistently, right? That there's going to be some wear and tear, but if they've had previous injuries that they haven't recovered from mm -hmm. or a newer injury, then that may um, decrease performance. So that's yeah. like step one. And a lot of people sometimes look at me sideways, like, what do you mean we need to go get a physical? What do you mean we need to go get right. cleared by a medical professional? What do you mean we need to like fill out a part Q? Right. That's like step one for me. Right. And that's something you, a lot of times you have this program in mind yep. that you, you know, you may be 16 weeks out from a fight, yep. but it's like, well, they're banged up, they're dinged up, maybe even from sparring or whatever. And it's like, okay, I've got to adjust on a day-to-day -day basis, that program. It's like, you have the long-term goal in mind, which could be months away, but then on that day-to-day -day basis, like you're always checking in right. with your athlete. 
Yeah, and I like to be proactive instead of reactive. So if we can address health and well-being in the beginning and we can work in ways to provide corrective exercises, time to recover, et cetera, so that way when we get to eight weeks out or 12 weeks out, we can just follow the script. We can just follow the program yeah. and we can continue to progress instead of having to make adjustments right. for volumes, loads, intensities. I've seen, I think it works a little bit better that way. And yeah. then a few other aspects that I prioritize um, are movement, just motor patterns. Like how well, like what's your function at the ankle, knee, hip joints? Yeah. How well do you rotate, you know, at the spine, right? Um, how yeah. well do you rotate at the C-spine? So. I mean, cause gosh, that has huge implications for injury prevention. If you're more mobile in some cases, like you want to, you want to have some stiffness, but some mobility, but then also just for, for getting, being able to put an opponent in certain holes. Yes. And certain submissions, you've got to have that that being mobility. able to get out of yeah, certain holes and submissions. Yep. If you're not flexible, you can't bend or extend. You'll find yourself like stuck yep. in, in positions that you don't want to be in a like lot that. of times. Be able to bend and extend. Yeah. yeah. Anything else you want to specifically mention about prioritization that you prioritize prioritize or want to move on to the next? Well, sure. There's so you have health and wellness, and then you have movement capacity. And then we get into the fun stuff, right? Things that strength coaches are interested in more often than yeah. not, like muscular strength, uh, muscular power, and then like speed and cardiorespiratory fitness. So um, I think they're all valuable, but I kind of have just kind of an order of how I, how I approach them. Now, are we going to get into that in the slides coming up, or do you want to give – what's your order? How would you rank if, we, if we're talking about these different what I would call fitness domains, muscular strength, you know, power, flexibility – mobility, body comp. I mean, all these different cardiovascular endurance. Yeah. Like how would oh, you, yeah. if you're going to prioritize like one through five or one through six, you know, how would you, how would you rank those? Sure. Uh, number one, healthy and well. The number two, the capacity to move different planes of motion, um, different ranges. And then number three, cardiovascular endurance. You need that engine, mm -hmm. right? So amateurs are going to fight at least three three-minute rounds. If they're fighting for an amateur title, five three-minute rounds, that's 15 minutes. And worst case scenario of constant work, right? Either we want to push that pace or their opponent is really trying to push that pace. Yeah. So you need you need that cardiovascular fitness. You have yeah, to be Yeah, that's fit. your base. That's your base. Bottom of the pyramid. That's your base. Establish that fitness and right. then we can build up to strength. So, and power. that might be a good way for people to visualize it. At the base of the pyramid, you've got healthy and well. Let's get them recovered. Because if you're not recovered from the last fight, you're not going to be doing very well going into the next one. Right. So you're healthy and well and building that cardiovascular endurance, that base. Yep. That's, the, that's the bottom of the pyramid. So now next level, what do we got? Then we're trying to optimize body composition, right? So we want to be around 3 to 5%, maybe above their fight weight at any given time. Um, for multiple reasons. 3 to 5% above their fight weight at any time. At any okay. time until we hit that fight camp which usually is six to eight weeks, right? right? So um, that's where we're doing more technical, more specific training. It's more intense um, on the mats, right? More sport specific. And then right. the weight room kind of mimics that. Right. But it so also, you're tapering off a, a little bit in the weight room. I mean, you still got to maintain yep. strength and explosiveness, but maybe you cut the volume, volume back. Down. Yep. Cut the volume back in the weight room. So yep. not as many sets and reps in the six to eight weeks prior to the fight. But then in, during that six to eight weeks, you know, it's like, yeah, you've got to really work on the, on the, the tech technical aspects. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yep. And so that'll, that helps with the weight cut, right? So mm -hmm. if you're 10% above where you're supposed to be fighting at, now we have to shift our training approach either in the weight room or on the mat or in the cage. Right. So that way it's not so intense that it drains, right. zaps all your energy. Yeah. Because. And if you're 10 or 15% above weight, then it's like, okay, now maybe you're not working in that six to eight weeks out before the fight as much on the technical aspect. You're striking, grappling, submission holds. Exactly. You're just trying to lose weight. So exactly. it's like you got to tweak the diet, exactly. take in less calories. Exactly. That can affect your energy levels. Exactly. It's going to be more more running, more just like we got to burn, burn this off. But then it, it's affecting – it's like – if you have to adjust one thing, it's going to affect all the Everything other components. Yep. It's all moving. There's a bunch of gears that are – that are um, working together in the whole process to get ready. Yeah. I'm sure you drill that in their heads too. Like, look, if you, if you're not crossing your T's and dotting your I's in each one of these areas, just slipping in one area is going to affect everything else that you're trying to do or that they're trying to do to get ready. 
Yeah, and that foundation was laid by the head coach and the owner of Carney Combat Sports, Richard Barajas. Um, shout out to you, Coach Richard. So they already had the standard, um, and also their former strength coach, Jack Ganglish. Shout out to you, Jack, um, where they laid that standard, and the, the athletes that I worked with were true professionals. So they knew, okay, so I'm supposed to be training at this level, this intensity. I'm supposed to be doing these things to help my body recover. I'm supposed to be at this weight. They were on top of that. They made it easy for me so then what's the next if we work our way up to the next level of the pyramid what do we got next i call it functional hypertrophy right so we're, okay. we don't train i don't train my athletes like bodybuilders although i will use similar rep ranges right so we want them to be functional so we want to put on lean body mass or muscle mass to right. contribute to sporting success right yeah. so um, not always are we going to go at like 70 percent one rm for intensity um, mainly because we don't want a ton of mass, and also they're not taking in a ton of calories. Right, right, right. right. That makes sense. So you, I'm, I'm sure you periodize that, and I'm sure you'll talk about it in yep, this yep. as we get into the slides. Uh, you know how you go about designing an appropriate periodized strength and conditioning plan for an MMA athlete, and then I guess if we keep going up the pyramid. So you got functional hypertrophy. Then, then what next? Then for me, I like to develop my relative strength. Um, so it's great for most athletes if you can develop absolute strength. How much can you lift? Like, I don't care how much can you how much you weigh, but how much can you squat? Um, right. But for the MMA athlete, where so much of their performance is dependent upon body composition, body mass, and how much force they can produce relative to body mass, um, because their opponent is at or around the same body mass. So typically for the squat. Um, like one and a half times body mass right. to 1.8 times body mass because I worked with Bantam weights. They're pretty light, 135 mm -hmm. pounders, right? So we don't need a ton of strength. Um, and we see that there's a diminished return, right? So right. if we ask a 135 pounder to squat 300 pounds, sure, maybe they can do it once or twice, but you ask them to do that week in and week out, you're going to wear out um, yeah. not only their muscles, but ligaments, tendons, joints. Right. Right. And, and yeah, you got to keep all that in mind because it's, you know, the sport is taking a toll on all those yep. tissues. So, yeah. Um, and like you said, I think it's, it's, it's important, like you said, to, to establish that relative and absolute strength, that base level of strength, because if you want to be powerful, uh, you need to have the ability to produce a lot of force, but you need to be able to display that force rapidly. Right. So it's not only just producing the force, but can you produce it very quickly? And so is that is that coming into the next? That's the next. The that's next. The, that's okay. the next. Yeah, is the ability to uh, produce that force rapidly, right? And it can be general. So when I say general, I think about um, jumps. I think about kettlebell swings. I think about Olympic lift variations. Or it can be super, super specific where we use maybe resistance bands. Maybe we use some type of way to implement. And we're going specifically to... Um, taking a shot, right, for a takedown mm -hmm. or strolling back, right, to defeat a shot. Or maybe we're doing striking or something similar to that to develop right. that power. Lighter there. loads, but you're moving them as fast, fast as, possible. as possible. And that's, that's, a, that's a key thing. And, you know, a lot of this comes with some of the research coming out of the Jayhawk Athletic Performance Lab. I know when, uh, well, Dr. Matt Hermes used to work in, and, and he did a lot of work looking at, you know, bar speeds and, and repetition velocity. And it's mm -hmm. like, and I'm sure you agree with this, no matter if you're lifting a light load or a heavy load, you know, obviously, if you're moving a heavy load by nature, you're not going to be able to move it as fast as a lighter load. But in your mind, you should always be trying to give that max effort and move the bar, the resistance band, the machine, whatever you're on, move that load as fast as possible, no matter yeah. if it's heavy or light. Of course, you know, if you look at the force velocity curve, a lighter load where you're not having to produce as much force, you're going to be able to move that very rapidly, like a one rep max. Yeah, you're not going to be able to move it as fast, but you should still be trying to in right. your mind. You want to be like explode and move that bar as fast as possible. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then what do we have above that? Power? Anything? Tell me Tell me when we've hit all your levels. <laughs> but then we have performance. Okay. okay. We're, we're going to start from the base. And I approach it that way, like just prioritizing. So that way we have some type of system. And we, my plan is like, okay, I want to see optimal performance but I need a system to make sure that I can check off each box along the way. And let's see if we got our optimal performance. Dang it, we didn't get it. Okay, so where, where can we improve? Let me get feedback from the coaches. Let me get feedback from the athlete. Okay, back to the drawing boards. And then we move this, we adjust volume, loads, reps, sets, workout structure, rest in between. 
All right, let's track it all the way up. Okay, we got optimal performance. Boom. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That athlete monitoring and tracking is so important through that whole process. And like you said, I'm sure you you met very frequently with uh, the coaches that the athlete was working with in their fight camp. And um, you know, you have to any any medical personnel. I yeah. mean, um, those meetings are so critical for, like you said, to achieve that optimal performance in the octagon or ring. We have any other levels? No, that's it. Optimal performance. That's the highest. So I think that's, you know, we we talked about prioritization. So, and we kind of already answered, I guess, question four. It was like, what variables are the most important to consider when designing a strength and conditioning program? Um, Is there any, anything you want to comment on that? Or should we just wait until we get into the slides? Uh, There are two more quick ones. Uh, Yeah. Okay. And I think they're really low-hanging fruit that oftentimes we can skip over because we're just so excited to get that athlete and start training them. Right. And there might be a lot of hustle and bustle if there's a short fight camp. Um, number one is training status. So they yeah, may be that's... an expert in their sport, but they may not have any experience in a weight room. That's an excellent one. Yeah, that is often <laughs> overlooked. Yeah. Yep. And then their annual training plan. So how many fights do we need to plan for? How many fight camps? Or Because sometimes the fighter may not be active, but they will be active to support another fighter. What do you typically see? I mean, how many how many fights? I know this is this is variable, but on average, a typical fighter that you worked with, how many fights in a year would they take on? That typically. You're, that you're planning for and trying to recover from. Yeah, and I'll show you in my slides why our situation was a bit unique, but typically um, you'll see like three fights. Um, So that way you have about four months per fight to kind of prep, recover, all those things. So it's typical for three fights in a calendar year for the MMA athlete. All right. Yep. Yeah, that training status, I think about that is such an overlooked overlooked variable. Um, You know, yeah, because just because – or they could be really trained, you know, like, like I said, they were an athlete, like a college football player. Right. And then they decide to get into MMA, like my buddy Austin. And it's like, okay, so they have obviously been getting plyometrics, explosive, you know, uh, sprinting, agility work, uh, mobility work, right. stre- a strength and conditioning program at a major college like Nebraska. So they've got that background. Right. But then it's learning all these other okay. sports-specific yeah. fundamentals so it's like, yeah, you can be very strong in this one area, and then you're catching up over here in the other, or vice versa. So that that makes a lot of sense. It's all it all should be tailored to what the the individual athlete needs, and you can't really use a cookie cutter approach. Right. I mean, all right. So um, I guess, how do you design a training program that supports optimal performance for a multi fight year? And this is where I want to take a look at this presentation of yours that you rec- recently gave. At I'm I'm probably gonna butcher this Universidad Autonoma de Baja California. There you go. All right, so you gave this presentation when was it November? Yeah, November 2023. 8th. Yeah, 2023. So, um, and you cover like I said the fundamentals for designing uh, an effective strength and conditioning program for mixed martial arts athletes. So this is where um, I just want you to uh, kind of walk us through these slides. Walk us through. All of your recommendations here. Okay. So I guess we'll go ahead and skip on to the next one. Um, anything you want to mention there? Obviously, you're part of the JOC Athletic Performance Lab, which is part of the Wusai Performance Alliance. You mentioned Carney Combat Sports already. Yeah. Um, you're obviously a professor in the Department of Health, Sport, and Exercise Sciences. So uh, we can probably go to the next one. Kind of an overview of what you're yeah. going to talk about here. So yeah, this is uh, these are slides from previous presentation, but in my presentations, um, they're typically two coaches and athletes, so I love to hit them with the bottom line up front, so that right. way we can just get right to it, right, and let them know like, right, just let are, me know what do I need yes, to do. That's exactly. all I care like, about. Here's what I we're what here's what we're do. trying to get to, and here's how we're going to get there, and then beyond that, I have background information, the intro, and then we talk about the period periodization fundamentals and i give um a real live example from the field from yeah the previous right. year so let's yeah, check can. it out then we'll keep moving along and so uh here we have the bottom line up front at the top end right kind of like the the high priority is to win um below that in order to win i'm really interested in building champions that's kind of my obsession right so um, while i do enjoy like training recreationally active and working with general populations um and enjoying like the long-term athletic development once they get to the stage where they're ready to train and compete yeah okay i want to build a champion um 
And so thankfully, like Harney Combat Sports, they had that vision and they share that same um, priority. So that made it easier. But what underpins building champions? Well, we need to optimize athletic performance. Um, what under what underpins that? Developing coordinated and or organized approaches to ensuring athletes are well prepared. So preparation, preparation, preparation is key, especially um in the fight game and combative sports, right? Mm -hmm. So if you cut corners or you like to prepare and you put your athlete in a cage, like it's kind of fun to watch on TV, but when you're there mm -hmm. in person and you have someone that you've been training and preparing, it puts a little, puts it in a perspective yeah. for sure. And, and, you know, if you're not prepared, I mean, and, and there's an opportunity that arises, you know, and I, again, I think of my buddy Austin out there, he, uh, a fight maybe a year or two years ago, he had a good fight and Dana White walked in and was like, I got my eye on you. And it's like, well, right there, you know, you've got opportunities potentially down the road. So you better stay prepared yes. all the time Yes. because those opportunities, you know, if you're not ready to take advantage of it, it can pass you by. You by. Yeah, you by. exactly. And it's so competitive, right? The pool is so deep in each weight class that mm -hmm. if you're not ready, next man up or next woman up. And it's just, it's just the way it is. Yeah. Um, and then under like preparation, we need to understand the demands of the events, drills, training, et cetera, right? Fully understand that. Um, and that comes through, of course, there's peer reviewed publications that, out that are available, but also getting in the gym, talking to the coaches, watching training sessions, and even participating in those training sessions too. Right, right. And then um, what underpins that? Ensuring your athletes are healthy, well available, um, they're ready to train, available to compete, and then just keep the main thing, the main thing. And like you said, it makes sense that healthy and well is at the, the base of the pyramid because it's like if you're not, you're not going to be able to train with uh, optimal intensity. Right. You know, and so then, I mean, that, that healthy, that recovered from injury has to be at the base, recovered from the last fight. Um, and I know you've hammered this one home, that last bullet point. Keep the main point. thing, the main thing. Yeah. That's it, fighters fight. Uh, yep. And that's the that's the end goal is we want to see them win, but we have to just keep it simple, and, keep it the main thing. And that's good, you being the strength and conditioning coach. It's like you're not trying to overtake everything. Like you said, you're no not way. trying to turn them into a bodybuilder. No you're not way. trying to turn them into, yeah. you know, a power lifter, right? It's like there's principles baked into the cake with that. And, so, and some of the way you design the sets and reps may be similar to how a power lifter or a bodybuilder or an athlete for another sport would train. But like you said, the main thing is – them their, their technical work yep. their overall fit they're recovered a lot of other aspects in there to to, to manage so right that's, that's good because I, I i'm sure some strength and conditioning coaches they do too much yep. or they try to yeah. they think what they're doing is most important and it's like well it's a piece of the puzzle but it's not the whole puzzle right yeah, yeah. my goal is kind of opposite i kind of want to be in the background i don't even want the coach or the athlete to notice right or training so they the athlete should be pretty fresh whenever they go train it shouldn't be like dang i hit a tough leg workout so i can't do this right so there's some always strength coaches fresh. could mess it up they, they can mess yeah. up what they're trying to do with their technical work yep yeah and, then, and, and that plays a huge role um i got invited to kind of try out a couple or free week of class and then you realize like wow okay so this is really really technical so if i screw up the stability or the so flexibility or there. the mobility is like okay so now i see the demands i can feel the training like, all right, so I better ease into um, some of our training right. programs, exercises, et cetera. So you get in there and do some sparring and yeah, grappling yeah. and stuff. Yeah. So it was it, fun. Yeah. It was yeah. really fun. All right. Yeah. So, yeah, that's yeah. good, though. Then you, like you said, you have understanding. You're going to understand it if you do it. If you do it. And yep. so literally by you doing it, now you're bringing that understanding into your strength and conditioning program design. You're like, oh, man, now I know what this is like now in the on the mat. So, yep. yeah. Yep, Exactly. Okay, uh, I think we'll go on to the next one. So this is just your background. You kind of already, I, I gave it in the introduction. Yeah, yeah we can. Um, probably skip over that. Oh, is there anything else you wanted to mention on there no, if we go back? No, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. Yeah, that's that's a background, kind of seeing performance at different levels. And, I was going to say, yeah, maybe you talk about who okay. you've worked with. So not only mixed martial artists, okay. you've worked with athletes at sure. these different levels and in these different sports. Sure. So maybe mention that. Yeah, so uh, I got my official start or unofficial official start strength conditioning back in 2016. I was done playing sports as a football athlete. And believe it or not, we did functional movement screening with cheer and dance at my uh -huh. university at the time that progressed into working with a wrestling athlete coming off of an ACL. 
we were able to build up strength, power, endurance, all those things. And he all American. It's like, whoa. Okay. I don't know at all, but I think I know enough to train athletes. And um, I had competed as a power lifter, so I founded a power lifting team. And then from there yeah. on up, I've worked with, um, I call it Pee Wee's the pro. So from yeah. youth athletes all the way up to professional levels. So that's kind of my background. I know you've got, gotten some athletes ready for like NFL combines. And, Combine prep um, and – it's like you work with some, some major league baseball players, uh, yeah, NBA. Yeah. So I worked for OKC Thunder um, a couple years back, and then I interned with Arizona Diamondbacks, consulted with Spellman Performance, so Les Spellman. Um, he's one of the great forward thinkers right now as far as speed development in American football specifically. Right. Um, so that was a great opportunity. Um, also, U.S. men's national team. So by working with Les, I got to contribute to their recent success as well. Yeah, a lot of great opportunities, all that background. It just helps you be a well-rounded strength coach, really, for Exactly. a lot of different athletes. Go on to the next one. Yeah, on yep. to the next. So the introduction here. So, yeah, some of this is from – some of this I mentioned earlier just about um, amateur fighters and kind of their demands of the sport versus professional fighters and their demands of the sport. But um, if you watch an MMA – fight competition you know that it's extremely intense demanding complex sometimes though it's it looks like it's more grappling based right um there's more jujitsu in there and it's so it may not be as intense but we better prepare depends on the fighter's background and style exactly styles. Yeah. exactly so we better prepare that fighter for best case worst case scenario um but generally, specifically, the physical, technical, tactical uh, preparedness can improve the athlete's chance of success. So um, at the general level, we're just checking all of our bases, typically in the weight room, right? Mm -hmm. So can they squat, step, hinge, lunge, push, pull, row? Can Say that they? again real slow. <laughs> can they? Because I think those are important, right? Yeah. I'll speed through that too quickly. Yeah. So you say that again. So can they squat? Squat. Can they step? Step. Can they hinge? Hinge. Can they push? Hinge at the hips, hinge right? Hinge at the hips. Can they push? Push. Can they pull? Can they row? Um, so those are some of your foundational movements. Just some foundational movement patterns. And so before going too advanced again. And then probably rotational too, or anti-rotation. You can, can you throw rotate, that in there too. Anti-rotate. Can you bend? Can you extend? Yep. And a lot of times we get athletes that are, they are experts in the sport, but they are beginners in the weight room and we jump too soon and put them in a very advanced program. And it's a detriment to the athlete. Um, they may make it through the program, but it takes so much time to recover. And they and that affects their training. And you really on. screen those movement patterns up front too. It's like, yep. oh man, they're great in the sagittal plane, meaning they can they can squat, they can lunge, they can step, they can hip hinge. But then maybe in the transverse plane, that rotation, they can't rotate, or you know, there there's there can be issues in different planes of movement that right. you could address in the in the program. Right. Sometimes there's compensation, but sometimes that might be their superpower. So we're careful. Not to undo right. that, right? So they may be super stiff on one side of the body versus the other. Oh, because they're right-handed. Right, but is it causing? <laughs> is it is it hindering performance exactly. or is it helping? Because exactly. you got to ask that. Like, is exactly. it exactly? Is this? Yeah, because sometimes asymmetries. You know, people always think, oh, a person needs to be symmetrical. Maybe not. Sometimes yes. Sometimes no, though. Right? right? Is it is this? Is it an asymmetry where they're at risk of injury or it's impairing performance? Okay, then maybe address it. But right. if not. It just may be an adaptation to the the type of uh, training they're yep. doing, right? Yep. And and how they fight. So, um, and I think too, you know, we talked. You mentioned it how amateurs typically fight three three minute rounds. Professionals mm -hmm. fight three five minute rounds. Mm -hmm. I think to some people that just watch the sport and haven't done it, you know, that doesn't sound like a lot. But man, you talk to anybody that's fought, <laughs> it's that's yeah. brutal. I mean. Three five minute rounds, right? Uh, yeah. If you're a professional, that's a it's a long fight. And you're almost doubling the amount of work per round, right? So you have at the amateur level, you have three minute rounds. You go pro, now you have five minute rounds, right? So um, in my mind, okay, we need to almost double the capacity work, for them to increase handle work capacity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for them to handle that amount of work. So, yeah. um, but beyond that. I like this last bullet point because I like to say strength conditioning is a tool, right, in our toolkit. So like you mentioned, um, by no means do we have to overtake, you know, the sport, the preparation for a competition or for a fight. Um, we're just a tool. We're just here to help support what the coach wants to accomplish. You're not a tool, athlete. Dr. Johnson. Oh, thank you, man. 
Appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I cut you off. Keep going. So no, yeah. So you're so, there to just to support um, yeah. the goals for the team, for the coach, for the athlete. So yeah, like you said, those those base you know building that pyramid right it just goes back to that the recovering the improved body composition movement strength power speed yeah there's just so many so many uh variables there to to address but uh you want to go to the next one sure let's go yeah. to the next one so periodization fundamentals so here we have some fundamentals um i think that i have them kind of organized into kind of like soft skills and then one is more strength conditioning based so i put the soft skills up top because those are most important i think especially in my circumstance so i hadn't been to the gym before i hadn't experienced a gym culture um my background in combatives is somewhat limited i wrestled for one year in middle school if that counts and i've trained a couple wrestlers and contributed to some research on that end but as far as like mma mm -hmm. it was pretty limited so i wanted to be sure that i checked those boxes like providing value developing meaningful relationships um, identifying shared goals then providing solutions so that's like the first that's like if we had to again like prioritize or put things into tiers that's tier one Right. Like if you can't provide value, you can't develop a relationship, you can't identify um, the goals, and you can't provide solutions, then uh, you're going to have a tough time really just meshing with um, your athletes, with the coaches, right. and improving, optimizing performance. Makes sense. Okay. And yeah. then you got you got the next uh, the yeah. next row there the next tier I guess yeah, I'll refer to it the as. next tier so once you uh, do those things in tier one then we can move up and all right let's look at the needs of the athlete um, let's look at the demands of the sport okay let's, so that's like day one a needs analysis day one let's look at um, the movement requirements let's look at common injuries let's look at common um, energy systems right um, and then also maybe let's look at past medical history too right. so that that's like your needs analysis from day one i want to see um and you literally yeah. have you know your questionnaires like health yeah. history questionnaires yeah. you fill and, out all of that stuff and they kind of like raise the eyebrow they're like oh like, do i gotta do this and who, who's this guy with phd who's this nerd coming in right. with all these papers and this fms kit that want you want to do movement no i'm kidding they really bought in they were all okay. the way they're like hey that's good um you're, well you're trying to be thorough yeah like i'm doing i'm yeah. being thorough for you like I want to see your baseline. Like you said, can you step? Can you yes. hinge? Can you squat? Yeah. Can you push? No, can they you really can bought you in. Yeah, they were like, okay, so whatever you're doing, you've had success. We want to be successful. Yeah. Teach us. Show us. We're, we're yours to, to build up. And so. any athlete that wants to perform optimally, if you're doing that needs analysis on day one and you're just trying to identify weaknesses, maybe deficient movement patterns, uh, you know, all you're trying to do is be thorough and make them better. I mean, it's for them. Right, <laughs> yeah. right, exactly. But you don't know if you don't do the needs analysis on day one. Exactly. I mean, you don't know where to go from exactly. there. So. Exactly. And then, yeah, the next step is just kind of looking at that training plan. How many competitions do we plan to have our fighters, our group compete in? Um, how many weeks apart are they? And then we start to look at, okay, what's the training composition? What are what days are higher intensity, what days are higher volume, what days are lower intensity, how much rest in between. So I'm really into the details of, okay, so if we can measure it, let's measure it. If we can plan for it, let's plan for it. Um, and by that, you can kind of prevent those pop-ups and soft tissue injuries. Right. You can somewhat prevent or at least um, be prepared for potential overreaching or overtraining, um, overuse. So, right. so we really, really... We did a great, we'll, I'll show you we'll some of our results, it. but we did a great job of um, laying out that plan and really working together, Coach Richard and I, and saying, okay, so for the group as a whole, where do we want them at? What's a priority? Okay, so what does this athlete specifically need? Okay, cool. And here's what I'm pretty confident is going to work. And then he's an expert coaching-wise. Is this realistic? Is this as something that the they do? As far as the technical aspect. As far as the technical. Okay. And does this, is this going to transfer, do you think? And he could tell me, yeah, absolutely. This is pretty common. Right. Or, yeah, probably it'll work. Let's try it or no. I don't I don't know about that. Mm -hmm. So that that's useful, too. Yeah. Yep. Makes sense. And then you've got testing and assessment. Yeah. So testing and assessment, kind of what we mentioned, um, past medical history, movement, and then we did some strength testing. Um, for me personally, I don't, for MMA athletes, a 1RM gives me decent information, but 
nothing more than I could get from a three to five rep max. Right. Um, so less risk and then high reward um, right. for the athlete. And then kind of how often are you testing and assessing different things? We'll do throughout, it throughout Thankfully the for them, they had just recently maxed out, so I didn't have to max them out. Um, I have their recent numbers, and I can kind of program off of that. Um, and then for me personally, I build it into the training. Um, so we'll build up to 3RM or 5RM gotcha. every four to six weeks. really depends on where they are. So you're basically able to stage. test and assess them throughout their training program the weeks leading up to a fight. Yep, and we can yeah. pretty much tell, like, wow. They're, they're ahead of or they're above where they were before. So it makes yeah. it more seamless and just trying to integrate to where there's not another thing that we have to do. Yeah. Yep. And, of course, all this, the needs analysis, controlling what you can control within the training plan, but yet also being flexible enough to realize injuries are going to happen. They get sick. Maybe they didn't. They haven't slept well for a few nights because they're yep. fighting with their girlfriend yep. or boyfriend. Yeah. or they're, You know, there's all these life variables and so you can't control that, but you can control what you can control in the plan. Yep. You do the testing and assessment to know where they're currently at, and 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 then maybe you need to adjust the, the program design. So all this leads into then the, the actual program the design. The program design and um, the National Strength and Conditioning Association has an acronym, FITVP. So F-I-T-T-V-P. And so that stands for Frequency, Intensity, Time, Type volume, progression. And that's kind of a similar approach that I take with designing my programs. Um, yeah. Just the, how many times a week do we want to train? That's your frequency. Yep. yep. And then the intensity based off of 1RM or predicted 1RM. So your percentage of your max load you're going to use. Yeah. yeah. And then time. Um, there are a couple of different things. How long is a session going to be and how much time do they have to recover before they need to go actually like right. participate in striking um, right. or sparring? And then... Um, how much weight are they lifting, right? Total. How much total weight are they going right. to lift in a session? That volume. And then in a week, and then a, across a month, and then across um, a couple months or cycles. Um, and then how can we, number one, program basic exercises as basic as possible. I love the simple, the most basic exercise, and then take them up to the most advanced. Man, and exercise. I love that you say that because – one thing that drives me nuts, and this is where social media can be a bad thing, is, you know, everyone's always throwing up on Instagram or wherever, like, different exercises, and they just look cool. But I'm always asking, like, and I think the first thing any good strength and conditioning coach should ask is, like, all right, number one, is this exercise safe, and is it effective? Is it actually performing this exercise? Is it, is it going to achieve whatever variable we're wanting to improve upon? whatever outcome that is, whether it's max force production, yep. it's rate of force development, it's it's improving mobility, whatever it is, it's like, is this the best exercise to do that? And so a lot of times the ones that look cool and get attention, like, oh, wow, what's that athlete? What are they doing? Very risky a lot of times, though, Yeah, they're, they're the riskiest <laughs> ones and the least effective, and it just drives me nuts. But it looks cool because yep. people never seen it before, so then they want to copy it and doing it. And then that the last thing you wanted to be doing is injuring your athletes when they're already beat up from the last fight and you're trying to get them recovered and well for the next yeah. one. And it's like, I, I agree, man. Simple, basic work. A lot of times it may be boring. Yeah. But that's what I was as far say. As, as maxing out your, you know, uh, your, your fitness levels in these different domains and getting you ready to perform optimally on the day of the fight, which is yeah. the number one, like you said, the main thing, the main thing. You want to be optimal on the day of the fight. A lot of times, basic works best. Yeah, and preparing for like optimal performance, like you said, sometimes it looks pretty boring. It is pretty boring, but it's just like the routine and the consistency. And yeah, um, yeah. Some sometimes people look at my programs like this is it. Like, yeah, that's it. It's that's basic. all. It, that's all it takes. And you're going to get into some well, examples of that, right? Yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll get into that. Okay. Yeah. You want to go to the next one? Yeah, let's go to the next one. I think it just kind of expands upon um, some of those tiers that I had, like providing value. So for whether you're a coach or whether you're a sports medicine professional, whether you're an athlete, whether you're a student or you're just someone viewing this, um, this talk, here are some ways that you can provide value. Um, through experience, education, or just uh, interest in the sport. Like, you're passionate about MMA. You don't have to be a great fighter. Some of the best coaches have never participated right. in the sport, but you just understand, like, wow. So I understand the demands of the sport. I understand the athletes. I understand the preparation that goes into it, and you take it serious. Yeah, and then you have the knowledge and educational background to help them out. Yeah, yeah. put it all to together in a 
a big stew, a big pot. That's right? it. That's it. And I'm actually, it's funny you keep mentioning that. I have a slide with like a crock pot on there here in a bit. Oh, yeah. So we'll kind of talk about that. And then, yeah, the other key points here, developing relationships above all else. I tell um, colleagues, I tell some of the students that I mentor, strength coaches who ask, like, we're in the people business. So we're here to serve people to the best of our ability. In order to do that, like, you have to, like, generally try to build relationships. Yeah. And it helps the athlete buy in. Because, I mean, you know how it is. We were both athletes. If you don't trust the coach, the people around you that are working with you, man, that's a problem. So you need to be able to trust that, you know, that coach that's working with you. Exactly. And and you got to get them to buy in. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And believe in what you're doing. Right. right? And, and and a lot of times they want to know, you know, as an athlete, you want to know why. Why am I doing this? Right. How is this going to benefit me? Exactly. So. Exactly. And then identifying goals long term to short term, set milestones. And then we have an acronym here. Um, the NSCA has also kind of shared this. I don't know that they created this, but um, they've published and publicized this. So the SMART goals where we're setting goals that are specific, measurable attainable, realistic, and time sensitive. Yeah. So um, and that's just kind of, I use that as a guide all the time. Then providing solutions in order to provide a solution. Um, typically they're shared if you're in a team setting. So mm-hmm. sure, I can come up with several solutions, but which one is one that is feasible, realistic, and that we can all agree upon? Um, right. Because I'd hate to step out of line and just start doing, you know, or start approaching a way or provide a solution without getting, you know, um, the agreement of the athlete, the coach. Yeah, know, that's so. where that communication with everybody yeah. is so important because they may have spent a lot of time, you know, working on their striking, their grappling, their technique. Yep. And it's like, oh, maybe maybe I should cut back a little on the, the strength and conditioning side of it. Yep. Or, you know, you have to make, you know, their hips, their thighs are just beat up. Yep. Uh, you know, maybe they took a lot of leg kicks, that thigh is hamburger. And it's like, well, we're going to have to adjust, you know, coming mm-hmm. off that fight, the training program for a little while. So yeah. it's the communication, like you said, with the fighter, the coaches, everybody else. Yeah. That's important. And the solution has to be easy to communicate. I think... With the more knowledge and experience that you get, it's easy to use a lot of jargon that's familiar to us, like strength conditioning jargon or sports science jargon. But you have to remember that your coach doesn't have a Ph.D. in health and human performance. Your athlete doesn't. So we have to communicate. This is what I'm doing. This is why I kind of like what you said. And this is how it's going to help you. Um, And just having those conversations. And probably, too, you see this. I know this is big in the field, strength and conditioning. There's a lot of egos out there. I'm not trying to point out anybody or names, but it's like, man, put your egos aside. We're all all here for the athlete, right? Right. I mean, so, yeah, putting that aside, that that makes it better for everybody. Yeah. And then you can go to the next one? Sure. All right. Yeah. So next slide. So more of these periodization fundamentals. So, So, Yeah. Um, And this just kind of explains what was on that two slides prior with the needs analysis, kind of what we've talked about. This was that bottom tier. Yeah, that bottom tier. So um, tier two, right? So with our needs analysis, looking at energy systems, biomechanics or common movement patterns and common injuries. Um, This helps not only in the preparation, but when we look at common injuries, being proactive. So thankfully... Um, there in Kearney, we had like an open clinic, and that was through the university. And I collaborated with the director of that clinic on some data collection. So we had a great relationship. And a couple times we sent our fighters in there because like they couldn't get into the urgent care or they couldn't get into the ER, and they took fantastic care of the athletes. So, what were a lot of the common injuries? I mean, I have a general idea, obviously, in my mind, but a lot of the common injuries you had to work around, and especially when they were coming out of a fight. And maybe you're trying to prepare them for the next fight and get them well and get them healthy. Like, what were you having to work around as their strength and conditioning coach? I mean, most often. Sure. Typically, well, um, hands, right? So you <laughs> might have, it may not even be a fracture in the hand. It may not even be a break in the hand. Mm-hmm. But it just could be an inflamed, super, super sore hand that we cannot get to calm down for anything in the gym. Okay, we need to go see someone who's a professional yeah. so they can address it. So hands, wrist, and elbow, that, you shoulder. Know, hand, it, you know, pushing and pulling. Yeah. Again, using the hands like, man, that's going to, Yeah, you, know? you need, they need their hands. And not only to punch, but like you said, push, pull, defeat, like yeah. leverage. Um, so their hands are critical. Feet, ankles, um, concussions are a common injury. Um, and MMA. So even if they're not concussive, they have symptoms. I'm going to do my part and recommend, hey, 
go down. Yeah. Go go see, go to the free clinic and let them check you out. And yeah. How do you explain to this energy systems is, is, is an interesting one too. So we have several different energy systems in the human body that we rely on based on the intensity of the exercise you're doing and the duration of it, right? And a lot of it is specific to the intensity. So for lower intensity exercise, like maybe you go on a walk or a jog, you produce ATP. This is the fuel or gasoline for your muscle cells um, through a lot of it's like the oxidation burning of fat. As you progress to higher exercise intensities, you rely more on glycogen, sugar that's in the body, and also phosphocreatine at those higher exercise intensities. So you, you make your ATP from the phosphocreatine and from the, the glycogen, the stored sugar, like in your, in your muscles. So maybe talk about, and you tap into those energy systems when you're doing very high intensity training, like a, a vertical jump. Um, you're going to sprint, you know, 40 yards or a hundred meters. Um, but, but in the sport of MMA, all of these energy systems get used, right? Yep. You, yep. you need to, become efficient at producing energy from phosphocreatine and glycogen. You need to become efficient at producing energy to go the distance, right? From those, all those, all those rounds, right? So you're not wearing out in that last round, you know, the last five minute rounds or five minutes of a 15 minute fight. Right. So I guess, how do you explain, is this something you really talk about with the athletes? Like you're going to be using these different energy systems and maybe they're very proficient or effective at generating energy from one system but maybe not from another and it's funny you mentioned that um because i actually unless they they're really interested i don't really explain it but okay. it's the first thing that they notice right so we'll talk about some of our uh, athletes that won championship belts and they're like i feel great i can do this again i can fight five more rounds like so um i, I, I do explain it to them but the atp pcr system that's that quick burst right yeah. that zero to six seconds typically in my mind um i haven't done the research but i think that we can as we develop it we can push the capacity of that system up to 12 seconds i would say and more elite well-trained athletes um, yeah but six seconds to 30 seconds is going to be more glycolytic right where we're utilizing um that available energy through carbohydrate and then that oxidative system is going to be your long slow mm -hmm. duration um and i can't give away all my secret sauce right but right. i would say that my recommendation to the practitioner would be not to focus solely on one energy system right to do your best to coordinate your training to where you can develop each at right. the specific times and you kind of line it up to where mm -hmm. of course you might need a shift at a certain point in time but um don't don't neglect the oxidative energy system. Mm -hmm. Don't neglect the glycolytic for the ATP PCR and so on and yeah. so forth. You recommend creatine for for your MMA athletes? Um, I don't. I'm not a nutritionist, dietitian, right. but I've seen that yeah. some of the top pros they are yeah. utilizing creatine. But also, those guys and girls they sleep well. They manage their right. stress they're hydrated they're making sure their weight is on track and so and that's something else There's that i so think about factors. so many factors before you supplement right. make sure that you have you check the box like hey are you sleeping yeah. eight to nine hours right i agree with that <laughs> so many people do i mean i did so many people like jump to the supplements first i guess we were just talking about creatine it made me yeah, think yeah. of it but yeah the, all those other core components um recovering sleeping eating healthy at the appropriate number of calories you need to maintain your weight or make weight. Right. I mean, like you said, the fluid intake, the hydration. I mean, th th those are all the basic core things. And then you can worry about the supplements later. It's get get those core components in line first. First. Yeah. 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 And then I guess we get into the annual training plan. So talk about what's, you know, a macro cycle, meso cycle, micro cycle. So your macro cycle, I guess for those of you and for me, is typically like our entire competition season, right? So it's like the big picture. You zoom out, you take a 30,000 foot view into what you hope to do. So for us, maybe we're fighting for and our or our fight phase is like six months. Maybe we're not fighting every single month within those six months, but that is our fight phase. Right, they're only going to say, let's on, say fight twice that year. Fight twice they're going to fight year. in, it's January 1, they're going to fight at like the end of June. Right. That's six right. months. Six months. Or or if you just think about the entire year, that could be a macro cycle, right? right. And we know every four months they're going to fight. Okay. And then the meso cycle, now we look into 
um, blocks or months training of training blocks. that are similar, or at least they we know that, hey, these four months from January to April, we have fight number one. So, and this is our opponent, and this is this is how long the fight's going to be, boom. And then your micro cycle is going to be something like your weeks leading up that make up your month of training. Right. Yeah. And so, and, and, and most, I feel like most strength and conditioning coaches you start with the macro cycle, right? You take, like you said, that 30,000 foot view, that bird's eye view, and then you work backwards, right. kind of. It's like, okay, well, what's the, what, what is the fight, fight night, fight day? And then you work backwards with the training from that. Yeah, yeah. and it's a good opportunity, I think. I think I, I'm a little bit outside the box. It's a great time to do some risk assessment. Yeah. Uh, hey, so what, what's worked well in training and preparation and what hasn't? And what do we think we might add in to kind of get them to the next level, yeah. push them over that threshold? And are you going to get into the type of periodization you use here in the upcoming Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about it. Okay. I have a, a couple graphs to kind of show. Because um, there's linear, there's undulating. Yeah, I mean, there's so many and, different and approaches. it shows um, my strength and conditioning training approach and then kind of the actual sports-specific okay. training approach. So, okay. yeah, yeah, we'll get into that. And then I guess the next column there, testing assessments. So yeah. um, what, do you, what do you have for us there? Uh, we've kind of talked uh, about that, just kind of body comp, um, yeah. movement capacity with maybe functional movement or just seeing how well they right. squat. In here so you and train them in these different areas, yep. you know, improve their cardiovascular fitness, improve yep. their muscle strength and endurance, their body yep. comp. And then you obviously need to test and assess those areas to make sure they're on track, right? Yep. And then the program design component. Now we've kind of talked like the fit VP, right? Mm -hmm. Frequency, intensity, time, type, volume, progression. Um, then we also think about exercise selection and order, and then how we structure our workouts and the amount of rest. In between. You're going to get into that. Some of your favorite we'll, we'll exercises. Get, we'll get, and things. It, we'll get okay. into that. Yeah. All right. So we'll go on to the next one. And so, um, yeah, here we have some some more periodization fundamentals and kind of what we've talked about. Um, yeah, these pyramids, these hierarchies of athletic development. Physical so. preparation is at the base for a lot of these. Work capacity is at the base. Also, evaluation testing is at the base. Um, so starting there, and I kind of follow. I mix and match a little bit, but I love to develop physical first. Right. And then we go more technical and then more tactical. Then at the top, you'll see psychological preparation. So there's something you might have heard like, Mindset, mm -hmm. mental skills. Yeah. I'm not a big mental toughness, but it's just ingrained in right. how we train. Yeah. Well, and in the sport of MMA, I'd say more than a lot of other sports, yeah, you better be mentally tough. Right. I mean, because you, you've got to be prepared year round, might take on a, a fight out of nowhere. So, uh, you know, just being able to handle the, the pain and everything. I mean, yeah, you've got to be mentally tough in that sport. I mean, it's, it's almost, it's part of it. And I do like how physical preparation is at the base um, just because. Yeah, you know, if, you're, if your cardiovascular system is fit and you've got, you know, the work capacity and the muscle strength and explosiveness, well, then you've got that base. Then when you go work on those technical skills, yep. the striking, the grappling, the holds, all that mat work, you're going to be able to do it for longer. Yes. You're going to be able to do it more efficiently and, and just be more effective at all that, that technical prep work. Right. Yeah. Anything else you want to add on this one? No, not really, but for whoever's watching, if y'all have questions about it, they can they can contact me, yeah. yeah. He'll give his contact info at the end. At the end, so yeah. So give him a shout. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, we'll go to the next one. Ah, there's your crock pot. There's my crock pot, and there's my pressure cooker, too. Right, the inst right? yeah, those pressure cookers are great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I need to make a roast. And we're in the Midwest, so I figured right. that we better add this in. Um, so this is kind of, this reminds me of how, to, how I take um, or my perspective on developing athletes, right? So in that crock pot, right? You can take your time, slowly develop, slowly cook, right? And it's a lot of ingredients it's going in. A lot, in. Of, a lot ingredients of ingredients going in there. And you take your time and you let that thing cook. Before you mm -hmm. know it, you have a delicious meal. Or before you know it, you have a very well-prepared athlete that that's performing sense. well. Um, it's a good analogy. Yeah, so <laughs> that my approach is more crock pot style if we, if we can and we have the time. But there's also um, that pressure cooker, that Instapot, to where um, you can still get a quality uh, meal out of it but we're going to put a ton of pressure right on that athlete um, right you tell them that you're like like what do, what do you mean dr johnson what do you mean coach is like yeah i'm gonna 
my approach is crock pot style. Yeah. But I'm also going to put you in a pressure cooker at some point. Some right? point. Like, let me explain. Some point. <laughs> if, if we have to, and, and it kind of helps with coaches too, having a conversation, like depending on how far out we are from right. a fight, like, okay, so we're, we're not going to sacrifice. We're not going to put that athlete, um, in a tough position as far as like performance, but just know there's going to be a bit more pressure that we're going to have to put on them to develop at the correct time. times the in, correct in the time. meso cycle or the micro cycle. Exactly. Right. Yep. yep. All right. We'll go on to the next one. Okay. So, um, this slide pretty much, there are a couple different key phases whenever we're, um, prepping, the MMA athletes, so we have our off camp typically, and then we have like a pre-fight camp, and then we have a fight camp, um, then beyond that, yeah, post-fight camp. So yeah, tell us what the off camp is then. So essentially you're off camp, um, you're training, but you're not preparing for a fight. So um, you're still um, going to your technical sessions, you're still sparring, you're still striking, you're still grappling, um, but you're not preparing for an opponent. You're still in the weight room. You're still um, lifting weights. You're still doing your mobility work, corrective work. You're still doing your cardio, um, mainly to maintain your fitness. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, for here, my goals typically um, make sure we have optimal body composition. Make sure we develop general strength and fitness, and then we address any weaknesses. Um, right. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a weakness, but maybe something that we can improve health, well-being, mobility, et cetera. Um, yeah. So and even yeah. those other things, like you said, it may be their sleep habits, their their nutrition, other things that you can um, potentially recommend. Or if you don't have the answer, you recommend them to, like you said, it's somebody somebody else that's part of the team yes. for the athlete. Yep, yeah, exactly. And we also have um, kind of the composition of our training. It's primarily general. So we're doing very general movements. Um, and they, so I say so general. 80% of it general. General. Yeah, in this off camp. And 20%. So 80% looks nothing like what they do out on the mats or in the cage. Right. Um, but 20% kind of, and whether that's like through energy system development or through a couple specific exercises. Um, yeah. Which I guess talking about exercise, it leads into your approaches. So maybe talk about, you know, what are some of your favorite multi-joint <laughs> compound movements that you that you work on, like say in this off camp phase, squat, bench, deadlift, press, overhead press. Um, when I say squat, we don't always have to squat with the barbell, right? right? So we can do, um, we can do belt squats. We can do band squats. We can do goblet squats. Um, but the main thing is that we want to improve mobility, flexibility, range of motion, stability at multiple joints at the same time. So that's a compound movement pattern. Right. Uh, for bench press, it could be with a bar, but we could also use dumbbells. We can also use kettlebells. We can also use resistant bands. We can also do push-ups, um, regular push-up, incline push-up, decline push-up. So there's so many different variations um, to develop what we want there. Okay. All right. And then plyometrics. I love seeing that, you know, working on your, your rate of force development, exactly. your explosiveness. Exactly. So here we're just trying to develop this base. So this is general physical preparation. Um, so here we're trying to teach the athlete how to land and absorb force mm -hmm. appropriately um, and then how to produce that power. So it could be as much as a concentric dominant vertical jump. So where they're sitting down and we just ask them to do a vertical jump land mm -hmm. um, or they're sitting down, we ask them to do a vertical jump onto a box, um, or we could just ask them to do squat jumps, something right. similar. Now, do you, do you utilize these in your program? Do you have like separate days where you're doing plyometrics or do you incorporate it into their general, like strength training that day? You know, maybe like a complex or contrast training where, you know, you, you may do a squat movement as your strength exercise, and then you go into some sort of, you know, vertical jump or some sort of plyometric exercise that mimics that squat yep. or that lunge. So you're incorporating the plows in the same workout. In the same workout and okay. typically like to contrast them. Um, so if we can do some type of loaded squat and then we can do, and I, I'm modified a bit for the athlete and where they are and for the sport. So, right. um, and if you can do it with the more basic exercise, that would be my recommendation. So we'll squat right. and then we'll do some type of um, vertical plyometric. I like that. Yeah. I've got some videos up on on contrast complex training and that, you know, trying to generate that muscle potentiation. That's it. That's, that's, that's it. really just good. enough. Really good. Yeah. Um, and then your core and accessory 
approaches there. Maybe yeah, so, touch a bit on that. So for core, we'll typically do um, some type of plank. Um, we'll do some type of flexion, some type of extension. So like a flexion for core, I would say, are like crunches, sit-ups, loaded crunches, loaded sit-ups. Um, your anti or your extensions are going to be like your reverse crunches where you're stable in your upper body, but your lower body extends in and right. out, in and out. Um, your plank is your plank. Then our accessories, we kind of get into more bodybuilder type training. So curls, extensions. Just to keep some muscle mass yeah, on Yeah, that's yeah. it. And we, we give them just enough and not enough to make them sore, right? Right. Um, but just enough to kind of build. Stimulate up. that muscle growth, that that's hypertrophy. It. Yeah. Yep. And then how do you, let me ask you this. Different strength coaches define what we commonly call like the core of the human body differently. Mm -hmm. Me this is how I define it. I want to know how you define it. So I've always included the core. Like when I was a strength coach and worked with athletes, it was like, okay, glutes. So yep. your hip extensors, right? You need those to be powerful. I'd include the hip flexors in there. Also, obviously the abdominal muscles, you know, transverse abdominus, rectus abdominus, internal, external obliques, all those abdominal muscles. And then the erectors, like the low back muscles. Yeah. And every every coach is going to have a different definition of what the core is. I mean, do you do you consider all those part yeah, of the core? Those are all mine, and um, any given day we're doing glute bridges as part of our core work. Yeah. Um, so to develop those glutes, um, any given day we're doing adduction, abduction with mini bands. And there's so much hip core. extension when you think about the sport of yes. MMA. I mean, having strong glutes that can powerfully extend the yes. hips. I mean, it really is. Like, you, I, I don't know any athlete that has a flat butt if they do they're probably not powerful you know right. like you look at your powerful athletes i guess that's how i should phrase it a powerful athlete does not have a flat butt <laughs> i mean that's just what i'd say i mean a sprinter right perfect right. example yeah. right you look at sprinters got a butt on right that's your, your power right there so that's all i got with the uh the butt talk <laughs> <laughs> you want any more on this slide no this is our gpp or general physical preparation phase off camp okay so yeah. then we'll go to the next one Pre-fight camp now. So now, um, maybe if you think about football, basketball, soccer, how they prepare for their season, like their preseason, so leading up to that competitive phase, we kind of have our pre-fight camp for MMA athletes. So now we're starting to transition from very general exercises, right, um, general movement patterns to more specific exercises, specific intensities, loads, movement patterns. Um, also, um, our athletes have, they've committed to terms to fight, but they're not actively preparing for a fight, meaning they're not in a fight camp. Right. So um, this so is So we're not into the, that six to eight weeks not before yet. the fight, not yet. This yeah. is like the calm before the storm. Gotcha. So we can kind of see it on the horizon. We can feel, you know, we can feel it in the air, but we're almost there. Um, so here for me, some of my goals, let's try to maximize strength, specific strength at that. So, um, and then let's max, maximize anaerobic fitness and their ability to recover. Right. So your, your ability to clear out that lactic acid, those yes. hydrogen ions, that yep. all of those factors that when you're in maybe the later stages of the fight, the late stages of around those last 30 seconds, the last thing you want is to be dealing with muscle fatigue, which could be due to high levels of, you know, hydrogen ions, acid accumulating in the muscle, muscle and yep. interfering with muscle contraction and your ability to produce force. Like, and you can train that to yeah. make them more efficient at clearing out lactic acid, clearing out, you yeah. know, and, and so that you're good. I mean, because th those last few seconds of that round, you see some guys that you kind of wonder, man, is their muscular endurance not up to par? Yeah. They're kind of, oh, man, they're not able to hold like a submission hold and yeah. they get it reversed. Yeah. And it's like you can see that conditioning is just slipping a little bit in the late stages or – and, you know, anytime you're building up that lactic acid, those hydrogens, that's interfering with your ability – for your muscles to contract with maximal force and you're you're going into a state of muscle fatigue exactly yeah so that's what we're trying to do um is at least and i think it's beneficial to do it in the pre-fight camp because once again the fight camp like the coach wants to see them performing optimally so it's it's not too late but again well, now we're going to have to put them in a pressure cooker to try to develop those yeah. qualities so we'll, we'll do it in the pre-fight camp instead um and the approach is similar we're just going more specific exercises. So if we're doing multi-joint compound movements, um, now we can go from bilateral movements to unilateral movements. Let's use one leg instead of two, one arm instead of two. Um, let's 
move with more velocity, more intent. We've already developed strength. We've already developed muscle mass. Okay, let's start to try to get that to transfer, that force to transfer into power. Um, gotcha. I like that. So, yeah. so not super specific, but this is like our transfer phase. So, um, getting more explosive here. Yeah. More explosive. Yeah. More relative to the the sport. And, it's and then some maybe you're incorporating some more intense plyometrics. Yeah, yeah. or more repeat plyometrics, right? right? So multi-response type jumps. Um, sometimes we might load the jump too, just a little bit, and then we'll go into an unloaded jump. Right. Do you, have so, do you have any like reactive component with the plyometrics where you're having them react to a stimulus or anything or, or the agility work? For, let's say oh, if you're doing yeah. some agility work. We'll do speed like ladders. Reactive. Okay. We'll do some speed ladder work and they'll hop, hop, hop and then come back. And then we had some fun. I will lay down cones. And so they would like work their way through the cone and back and back. Right. Are and you back. having them react to anything? And then I take the cones away. Okay. And then that's whenever it becomes reactive. And so oh, okay, I'll say, good. Yeah. go switch. And then go, switch, switch, finish. And then so they're working through, boom, boom, boom. I like that. Because so many strength coaches, you know, they'll be like, I'm training agility. And I'll look at them like, no, you're not. Not if there's not a reactive Reaction. component. Right. I mean, you're, changing, you're, you're training change of direction. Right. But the athlete, if there's no com- something to Stimulus. react to, right. they know when they have to change direction. It could be at that cone, I got to change direction. Or, you know, maybe you are going through a ladder and you know the footwork pattern. That's already in your mind. Right. So it's not really reactive. Yeah, you may be working on change of direction. But agility, being agile, you have to react to a stimulus that's not planned, which right. you've got to do in the octagon in the ring i mean you're reacting all the time to what your opponent is doing right right? so it's like that i like that you have the uh when we're talking in terms of agility here it's like being able to change direction and move in response to an unexpected stimulus and there's so much there's so many different sequences that may take place even during training like if you don't have rhythm coordination and you haven't developed these motor patterns to respond right or you're not used to it it can it can put them you know, you can right. put them at a disadvantage if you yeah. don't prepare them. Yeah. And then I guess you see the the strength and conditioning, the composition of the program there now. So the the general preparation, the percentage has went down some. So you're at what, you know, 60% for, for general prep yeah, and we're, then 40% specific. So so getting more technical now with their, yeah. like their grappling, right. their striking, right. working a higher percentage of the time spent on those components. And like just in the weight room too, now we're going more specific to their fight. So we've pretty much doubled our emphasis. So we went from 20% to 40% to where, okay, if you step in the weight room, huh, that kind of looks like something that they might do on the mat so it could okay be, so that's what you're meaning by yeah, specific yeah, there yeah, okay i was yeah. thinking the other so so yeah maybe you explain that yeah too. yeah exactly so um if we have an athlete that their strength is striking you might see some type of dumbbell punch circuit um paired with med ball slam right. circuit Resistance or something like that yeah. yeah and so then you might see and why are they sprawling in the weight room or why are they taking bandit shots you might see something like that um during this phase okay so yeah i see what you mean by more specific now okay yeah anything else you want to add on this one or move on to the next um i think for pre-fight camp my recommendation for those out there four weeks is pretty optimal it's a it's a good period so you have about a month in pre-fight camp to really start to um Get more specific with your exercises training approaches before so th- with the camp. off camp like let's say again a fighter has a uh, he's he's gonna fight six months from today mm-hmm. so how long would that off camp be i would say off camp should be about two months two months so, okay or eight weeks so eight months. weeks yep. for the off camp yep. then now we move into this pre-fight camp which you said is like a month a month yeah about okay. four weeks i think six weeks are probably going to be your high end okay for that pre-fight camp So that's the meso cycle, that four to six weeks for the pre-fight camp. Yep. And then do we want to go into the next? Yeah, let's go into fight camp. So next next slide is fight camp. So then how long is this phase going to last? So this is going to be, um, it could be two weeks if you take a short notice fight um, or if somebody gets hurt or if the card changes, all those things, but ideally four to six weeks. Okay. Yep. Or, or four to eight weeks if you have a big championship belt. Coming okay. Up, so. Okay. And then just the definition of fight camp. I mean, we kind of already. 
Yeah, really so this it. is our focus training period. We have a fight. We're prepping for a fight. Um, it's all hands on deck to get a fight fighter or fight team ready to go out and kick butt. Right. Yeah. So this is going to be where, again, you're, you're starting to work a lot on the uh, – a lot more focused on the, the technique, the technical aspects. Yeah, yeah. So it's going to shift um, in our focus for the preparation to where it's all, like, technical. All, like, okay, so what does a fighter do? Um, where are their strengths? Okay, we're going to hone in on that in the weight room. Now I'm shifting to more explosive strength. Um, for me personally, depending on the athlete too, but typically you can't go wrong developing that explosive strength. Um High intensity anaerobic training, so anaerobic threshold training, so repeat short burst efforts, right? And again, like they're going to be doing in the, exactly, in the octagon or in the exactly. ring. Repeated high intensity short burst efforts, yeah, yep, and yeah, and then the recovery. Um, so we're going to dedicate our resources there to make sure that they're recovered and can recover. Um, so yeah, those, those those are the goals for fight camp for me at least. Okay. <clears throat> And your approaches? Yeah, some of our approaches. So now we'll shift. Um, now we've developed strong athletes. They're able to um, transfer that force, right, um, depending on time. I'll introduce some Olympic lifting variations. So we can do some jump shrugs. We can do some high pulls. We can do some hang high pulls, um, maybe a hang power clean. Um, mm -hmm. For me, typically I don't like a ton of overhead stuff, mainly because the shoulder and the hand and the elbow and the wrist, if they're doing a ton of striking. Um, right. You don't want to compromise them. Put them in a compromising yeah, position with the bar up yeah, overhead. Exactly. Or, yeah. We might do a half kneel landmine press if we want to go overhead, or you can't go wrong with a dumbbell right. overhead press. So kind of more open chain to where they can kind of navigate that range right. of motion versus barbell, which is closed chain, yeah. and it restricts. Um, yeah, you're locked in. Yep. I mean, so yeah, that's you're keeping athlete safety in mind first and foremost, especially in this fight camp. You, you know, you're you're just a few weeks out from the fight, so the last thing you want to do is mess it up. Exactly. <laughs> as, exactly. As a strength exactly. And conditioning exactly. Coach. So yeah, yeah, we're we're reducing those training volumes in the weight room. We can input, increase um, that intensity um, at specific times, specific days, and then beyond that, let's focus on keeping them healthy, getting yeah. through the fight camp get them to the fight what might be and you may be getting going into talking about this like are you going to get into talking about like the frequency and like yeah, the fight camp so. versus um, off camp like how, how often would you be unless if you want to save it for later no, we sure we can about, we can talk now yeah. like like what would be the frequency of training in, in each of these different phases so if we look at this fight camp versus like say the off off camp i mean how frequently are they coming to you and working you know, with their, their strength and conditioning coach? Like, what's the frequency per week? Sure, I would say for, I would bet the majority of fighters off camp, three to four days of a sound strength and conditioning program. You're going to see progress. You're going to see improvement. Then your pre-fight camp, two to three days, I would say. So you may not need four days of right. training in that pre-fight camp, and then time becomes an issue, right? So if we're spending the same amount of time in the weight room, but they're increasing time out on the mats in the cage, right. all right, so now volume is going to start to creep up on us, um, just that total like training hours in the gym. Right. And then in your fight camp, typically, uh, it depends, one to three days. Uh, right. Ideally, you get at least two days. Two days. With your that's fighter. what I thought. That that's what I'd look at as being the sweet spot. You get in two strength and conditioning training sessions, fight camp. You know, evenly spaced out. I don't know, like a Monday and Thursday or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Um, and then again, the other days, it's going to be geared heavily towards that working on that grappling, that striking, you know, sparring, all of that yep. technical aspects. And then what, as far as time, you know, how long is a training session in each one of these phases? It depends by strength coach for me personally. Um, we worked we worked within like an hour to an hour and a half. So okay. get in, um, you know, hey, how's it going? How you guys feeling? How body's feeling? Okay, well, let's roll out. So we'll foam roll, do some off fascial release. So everything from movement prep to the warm up, and then explain the list for the day, and then give them a couple warm up sets, and we jump into it, condition, and then hydrate, recover. Get them out the yeah. gym. Get off your feet. And I know you said like in this fight camp, because so they come in maybe twice a week, you're going to be cutting the volume back. You don't yep. want to wear them out and yep. you don't want them being all fatigued trying to go do their technical exactly. training. 
But I think, and I'm sure you do this, you still keep the intensity high. Yeah. You're, still, you're still moving heavy loads or, or you're moving light loads very fast. Yep. So you're still training intensely. It's just the time is cut down and the total number of sets and reps, the volume is cut down. Because that's what really, I think, kills you know, the athletes is if the, if the strength coach doesn't adjust the volume. Yeah. I and mean, they you start getting to. overtrained. I mean, you or, have to. Um, you know, they're overreaching if they're not overtrained. Right? right. So it's like, yeah, that volume. But some strength coaches, They'll cut back both. Like they'll, oh, we need to lift lighter loads, and we need, and we also need to do less sets and reps. Well, it's like no, like you've already built up this level of strength. Right. It's not going to be that hard to maintain it. You can cut back the sets and reps, but you you need to be still moving those heavy weights. I right. mean, to maintain that strength going into the fight. Exactly. You have to have that. Yeah. Just yeah. Had to keep training. Okay. Want to move on? Yeah, let's move on. I think we got some good slides coming up here. And so this is post fight camp. Post yeah. fight camp. This is important. This is a restoration phase um, where they're not necessarily training. We're just focused on resting, recovery, planning for the next fight. Um, even if they won the fight, typically there might be some type of wound, abrasion, yeah, um, something that we need to address. So let's get them patched up. Let's let them rest. Um, hands eat some messed of, up. Hands thighs, messed thighs up. Thighs are hammering. Thighs. They're fighting somebody with Muay Thai. Yeah. <laughs> somebody and just getting thigh kicks over and over and over again. Yeah. Can't even walk. Yeah. Exactly. So we take some time or we at least plan for the time. Hey, this is recovery period. Um, you don't necessarily have to come into a strength session. If you do, it's going to look a little bit different. Um, so right. we might just focus on flexibility, mobility, all those things until um, you're ready to go back into an off camp or a pre-fight camp. Yeah. So. Any any other kind of modalities you might use outside of the weight room? You doing like any anything in in the pool? And I mean, I don't know. Just I'm just thinking outside the box that you might use in this post fight camp to help them recover. Yeah, you can use ice tub. Come on, give us you some can of your use secrets. Hot bath. You can <laughs> use. I know, like in an athletic training room, they'll use like ultrasound or they'll use electrical stimulation. Yeah. Um, really to kind of activate that muscle. Um, and to help decrease soreness, stiffness within the muscle, mm -hmm. um, the tendons, the ligaments. Massage is great. So, I mean, there's all type of things. There are guns that have like a little vibration yeah. gun. So, the percussion. I mean, yep. you have a percussion. Um, yoga is great. There are a ton of different things. And it depends. Sometimes I don't, I won't recommend yoga, especially after a fight. I don't think it's recommended. If you have abrasions and things like that, it's just kind of better to let yeah. them naturally heal. Um, so that way you don't disrupt. Um, the tissues yeah. during the healing phase and process. And then your approaches, and you see, I think the common theme here that, that everyone should be seeing by now is the approaches are very similar in yes. each phase, Yep. whether it's post-fight, pre-fight, you know, off camp. I mean, you still see those multi-joint compound movements, the core work. Um, so, so you're seeing, you know, obviously though, you, you're not going to be doing, you know, plyometrics, no. explosive plyometrics. You're pretty beat up after the fight. So the last thing you want them do having to do is trying to absorb more ground reaction forces and things like that. Right. So, you know, the plyometrics are cut out here. Yep. Um, but yeah, it makes sense that a lot of the approaches are very similar. It's just manipulating, well, what volume should I use? How long should the time be? What should the frequency of training be throughout the week? Those are the important factors to think about because you have to think about, what else they're doing, which is the technical aspect and yes. how that training is, is, is it, is there more of that going on or less? And obviously in the different phases, you know, yeah, pre-fight, they're going to be doing a lot of technical training. So yeah, it makes sense. Um, and then that composition of strength conditioning. Now it's all general. Yeah. Right? It's all general movements. Um, take a break from the specificity and just reestablish foundational movement patterns. Right. Yeah. All right. So next, next slide. So from the field here. So, yeah, this is, uh, I think it's important, um, especially like strength conditioning, even strength conditioning research that applied practical hands-on experience um, is very, very important. Um, number one, it helps whenever you're speaking to like subject matter, right, to be an expert in the field. Um, it's fantastic to have theory, but how do we apply that theory and what mm -hmm. are our results from application? But yeah, this is just like shared experience from working with the Carney Combat Sports Fight Team. Um, as you'll see, we had six, op six competitions in six months and 20 days. Um, so it was jam packed. Um, and I had a great opportunity to kind of apply all those things that I've mentioned in previous slides. And these are the results, three Bantamweight champions, 
Um, so two pros and one amateur. Giving those all all a shout out. So we've got. Oh, uh, Delfino El Gallo Benitez. What's up, um, Fino? So he was our first one. Okay. Um, yeah, first pro for the gym. And then these we are had, all bantam weights. These are all bantam weights. One thirty fives. Um, Vanessa Chavez, Venom Chavez. Um, she's our amateur um, women's fly or bantam weight champion. What's up, V? And then Jose Nano Hernandez is our pro. He okay. actually uh, won his belt out in Kansas City. Um, okay. So. Yeah, those Good are our, those are our three bantamweight champions. So we I trained a group of four, so three out of the four won championships. Um, okay. And we're waiting on the fourth one. Come All on, right. Hayden, we're waiting on you, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we go to the next one. So here now we've got a we've got a chart here: the strength and conditioning training volume, and then some more of those the, those tiers that we. There they are. It looks again. like the, the tiers are, are on there. Yeah. So um, kind of from the field experience, if we were to start from um, ground zero, where would we start? Again, kind of providing those, providing value, developing relationships, identifying goals, providing solutions. Then beyond that, we go more strength conditioning specific. But we can see um, in that chart the strength conditioning volume. So in the green is more like off camp and the yellow is more pre-fight camp and then the red is going to be our fight camp. The blue is going to be our um, post camp. Um, and you'll see, I'm sure you have some questions, but at week seven, there's like an asterisk, and that's where we actually started our fight camp. Yeah, so that's the weeks along the x-axis, the horizontal axis on the bottom. So yes. week seven, the asterisk there. Um, and then the y-axis, the vertical axis, that's, that's your training volume. Mm -hmm. Okay. So reps time sets pretty much for the week. Right. And so obviously it makes sense that in the, you know, the off camp, um, you know, they're in green, right? You said that was green. Yep. The, the training volume is going to be higher, yep. more sets, more reps. And then you see it tapering down, um, especially as you move into the red, which is the, the pre-fight camp. Yeah. Correct? So that red is a fight camp. Or yeah, the yep, fight yep, camp, yep, I mean. Yep, the fight you got camp. it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And you'll kind of see we kind of... It looks linear, right, for the most part, mm -hmm. where we're building up for three weeks and then we unload them for a week. And I knew that around like week seven would be the start of our fight camp. So it's like, you know what, instead of like delaying this high volume, um, let's just give it all to them in one week. And then after that, I'm going to leave them alone. I'm going to back off. So I cut the volumes in half. We'll increase the intensity. We'll keep them training. Everybody's happy. Right. Yeah. And when he says increase intensity, that's why I think it's very important. Like you said, volume is is reps times sets. If you add in load, that'd be volume load. Right. But when he says you keep the intensity high, it's like you're still lifting at high percentages of your, your max strength, of your one rep max, but you're just not doing as many sets and reps. That's cutting down the volume, but still keeping the load high. Yep. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Yeah, load high or just the intent high. Yeah. So the, if you don't want to go too high on the load, then, hey, we need maximal effort. Right. You're going to move a light load, but as fast, fast as, possible. as possible. So the intent is high, high intensity. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So, yeah. Anything yeah. else you want to add there? No, but just if you're kind of, if you're working as a strength coach in combative sports, it really helps if you can sit down and plan. Because just imagine if you're just training in four-week blocks, then, oh, we're starting fight camp tomorrow. Okay. And if you haven't laid the foundation right that right. you want to lay, then, um, yeah, it could put you at a disadvantage. That's important to ask because so many people, even even the average person in the general public, if I'm talking to them at the gym, I'm like, are you exercising or are you training? Right. Because there's a difference and they'll be like kind of confused. Like, well, I'm, I'm here. I'm doing my exercises. I'm like, well, then you're not training. Like right. if you don't have a plan. Right. I don't care what it is. It, it, you can maybe you're not an MMA fighter. You just want to lose some body fat and put on some muscle like a lot of people do. Well, then have a plan for that, right? right? Like there should be a reason you're doing your daily training sessions right? to achieve a goal. But if you don't have a training plan to achieve that goal, well, then you're just exercising. You're yep. just going in and, well, I'll do this exercise and then I'll go over here and get on the treadmill for a little bit and do that. And it's like, well, there's no training plan and your results are going to be suboptimal exactly. if there's no training plan. And for athletes... We try yeah. to avoid exercising, just exercising. We're trying right. to train. We right. want to train. Yeah. yeah, prepare them specifically. There's a purpose for everything yes. you're doing. Yes. Right. Yeah. 
All right, we'll move on to the next one. So here we have um, Fino El Gallo. Um, this is him. He won his belt. Um, it was a great fight. He won via submission in the final round. Okay. Fantastic. Um, and he has a great story uh, where he had been out, he had been injured, but um, we were able to develop him over time. You know, I don't know. I, he took this fight again, late notice, and he was just prepared. And I'm really glad that I kind of followed all these steps and yeah. made sure that anybody that showed up, that they were well prepared, whether you're fighting or not. And it paid off. But this kind of shows like off camp. Um, yeah, just kind of the structure of training and how I approach training the MMA athlete. So you maybe want to run through some of that, like a, a typical day here in the off camp. Um, you know, obviously your general warm up. Yeah, maybe just run through what sure. what a day would look like. There. Sure. So I kind of have the focus on the left side where we have each day we're going to do some type of warm up, like what I mentioned. Get in. Um, and check in, see how the athletes are doing, conversation, check the temperature in the room. Like, okay, they had a tough session last right. night. I better be prepared to adjust some places or, all right, everybody's just their normal selves or, wow, everybody has high energy. We might push right. in some areas, but that's the warm-up. How up. motivated are they? Yeah. See that on the warm-up. So yeah. then like a, what, five, 15-minute warm-up? Yeah, just get in five, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and then we have a couple strength blocks. And so this helps me organize my training. And then we'll do a circuit at the end and then conditioning. So day one is more lower body emphasis, right? So um, we'll do a lower body push similar to like a squat, um, whether it's barbell, goblet. I didn't do a ton of front squats, but that's an option. Right. And then I like to pair that with some type of lower body plow metric. Um, so it could be simple as a, I call it a gate swing where your feet go in and out and you drop your center of mass and drop down in and out. Gotcha. You'll see that it's pretty common in like wrestlers. Mm -hmm. So that way they can maintain their range of motion, plyometric yeah. metric or a squat jump easy. Then we'll do like a lower body, another lower body push. This might be some type of unilateral movement. Um, paired with a lower body posterior chain movement, like a RDL or a glute bridge. Yeah. Um, and then that goes, continues on to flexion, extension, crunches, reverse crunches, planks, and then we'll target the ATP PCR system. And we progress throughout the week and we, yeah. next day is more upper body emphasis. And then last day is more lower body pull, trap bar deadlifts typically. Okay. How many, yeah, I was going to ask you if you use that trap bar, trap bar deadlifts. I like those a lot. Um, how, what, as far as like sets and reps on each one of these days here in the off camp, like what are we looking at volume wise, uh, you know, intensity, loading, things like that. I mean, like how many sets would you incorporate throughout, you know, the off camp on these different days? Like three to four sets. Per like exercise? Per exercise. And then how many exercises total? Um... It depends because fighters, they do like either three rounds or five rounds. I would group them. So probably total, we're maybe doing five to seven exercises. Exercises. Yeah. So not, not too many because I have to teach them the exercises. And then by the time they get them down, I just didn't want a ton in my exercise library. So maybe right. five to seven. And get them to perform those basic, basic exercises movements. very, very good. Yes. Like be very proficient at doing them with the proper biomechanics and everything. Yep get excellent at producing them because if, if you can if you can get the um the movement pattern down right. using correct biomechanics then once your body has that ingrained you can really work on increasing that strength. max strength yep. and that force production yeah yep and then so. for reps typically for off camp for these for this type of athlete typically eight to ten repetitions okay um is what we're looking at so it's a little lower intensity you're maybe Oh, 80% of your one rep max, yep. 75, somewhere yep. in there. And that's kind of, I think, the sweet spot, mainly because I was new to the gym. I hadn't really seen the athletes, but, you know, based on conversation, okay, so we're in off camp. I know that uh, you can't go wrong with 8 to 10 reps, yeah. typically. That makes sense. You can sense. adjust, yep. Go to the next one? Let's go to the next one. All right, next slide. So functional hypertrophy. This is what we call functional hypertrophy. 
um, so we can kind of see our fighters here. Flexing, showing Flexing. Off the muscles. You see the buys, you see the <laughs> quads, yeah. <laughs> so, and then we have uh, on the right, that's Hayden. His mom sent me a message like, what'd you do to my son? And it's just like a his picture quads. of his quad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, like, I bulked him up, you know? <laughs> but, you know, some of that's important, too, from you think about it. Again, I, I was joking about, you know, fighters taking the low kicks. Like, if you're fighting, if, if somebody has a background in Muay Thai, and they're hammering that leg, you know, the outside of the thigh. Yeah. I mean, you know, having some muscle there just for, like, basically padding protection. Body armor. You know, you body armor, yeah. Armor. I mean, that can be where the, you know, we all know a larger muscle, you're going to be able to generate more force, but also, yeah, having some, some of that extra padding, too. But there's a point, like you said, of diminishing returns where you don't want so much muscle. You don't want right. them to be a bodybuilder. Right. Because then it could affect their endurance, they might fatigue out earlier in the fight. The range and that's of motion. A problem. Range of motion, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you get too much muscle, that can restrict the joint mobility and movement. And mm -hmm. Yeah, so there, there's a balance there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, You want to go to the next one? Sure. All right, next slide. So now we're on at, at pre-fight camp. So kind of taking a look at the, the daily breakdown here. Yeah, so we kind of see that we're transitioning, right? And the off camp, we had like a lower body push a lower body plyo now we have like a lower body speed push so essentially we're we're maybe manipulating the the intensity or the load on that bar and we want the intent to increase right so we're going speed push and then some type of plyometric some type of jump or continuous jump or gate swing as i call them um, and so that's the main change there everything else pretty much stays the same okay so just manipulating that variable there um as far now now what about Again, the loads, the rep ranges, total yeah. number of exercises in a session, things like that. So, yeah, we're still keeping, like, total number of exercises between five to seven at most. Per day. Maybe ten per day. But, again, um, it's well organized, and I have these blocks, so I know, okay, I want two here, two there, three here, maybe two here. And so you can see, like, strength block one, we just have two exercises. Strength block two two exercises circuit we might do three or four exercises and then conditioning um is typically a bike or a sprint or a jog or something like that um and then as far as like rep range we'll go maybe three to eight reps or five to eight reps so we're bringing down our reps um and then for the load we'll work in different ranges some days it's like 30 to 50 percent really to get that power output that we want um, some days it's like 50 to 80%. And some days if we really want to push strength, like if coach is saying, yeah, we need to, I think we need to push a little bit more. Okay. Right. We can go 80% above for a couple sets, yeah. a couple reps, and then back off. Right. Yep. Okay. Maybe talk a little bit about the conditioning. Like what, what might you do on say that day one to really target that ATP PCR system? So maybe, you know, repeated short sprints. Yeah. Um, yeah. Things like that that you mentioned. Yeah, I think when I joined the gym, they were doing, they might have been working up above like um, a minute plus of continued effort, high mm. intensity effort, and then recovering for maybe about a minute plus and then working back on. Whenever I joined, I prescribed for ATP PCR six seconds on and like 24 seconds off. And then we did, yeah. I don't, I forget how many rounds. That but four to multiple. one ratio. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's like you do six seconds of work, you're going to have. Um, four times that, so 24 yeah. seconds of, of rest. Of yeah. rest, and they were like, man, this is easy. What are we doing? We've been working at, well, I know, just just trust yeah, me. Yeah, and, and, and they trusted it, and we built it up to where, I mean. But then the glycolytic day is going to be different. Yeah, but, I mean, we worked up to, like, their ATP PCR being 8 to 10 to 12 seconds continued effort to, like, four to eight seconds of rest and we're repeating and we're going gotcha. multiple sets and then exactly like you said the glycolytic day and i wanted to separate separate it out too so we can focus um on our short intense burst burst yep. to our kind of intermediate but still somewhat of a burst and then to that oxidative so what'd you do on the glycolytic day like what were some examples there of training so kind of pushing that? up towards 24 to 30 seconds just kind of going textbook Right. Um, of constant high intensity work maybe a 30 second all-out cycle a cycle on a bike right on yep. a bike you just cycle as hard as you can for 30 minutes yep and then what type of rest period um we could work down once they're really really fit to 12 seconds yes. rest and Man. then go again and then go again and then go again so we would do maybe five bursts and then we'll take a two-minute break let's do it again 
And then, yeah, you'll you'll figure out how fit you are. Oh, yeah. And your, your thigh <laughs> muscles are going to be burning. But again, that's yep. helping your body, you know, to clear out that lactic Lactate. acid yep. Yep. to help you. Um, basically, it's going to promote training adaptations to where you're less likely to fatigue. Right. So, um, yeah, that's interesting. And then oxidative. I mean, here's just like your like long, slow distance training, like going on a long jog. Yep. You know, this yep. can obviously help not only with your cardiovascular, improving cardiovascular fitness level, but also like body composition, yep. weight management, things like that. As long as you're um, eating, like if you need to lose weight, obviously you got to be in a slight caloric deficit. Um, but because uh, you can't outrun a bad diet, right? Nope. So <laughs> so the, the diet's got to be on, on track there. But yeah, building that base cardiovascular fitness, just long runs, low intensity, cycling at a low intensity for a long time maybe swimming yep swimming laps things like that that's it so go to the next one let's go to the next one let's talk fight camp all right so now we're in fight camp so these are again um like you said about what six weeks four to six weeks leading up to the fight yeah four to six weeks leading up to the fight um and so you'll kind of see we've kind of transitioned more into speed right more into power um, because for most MMA athletes, that's typically where they train at. That, right. That's a sweet spot. But if we train for multiple months, just speed, power, right, we're not going to develop the muscle mass to support the force that supports that speed power. Right. Um, so that's what we see here is we'll do like some type of total body speed movement. It could be like a rotational bandit punch or it could be like a thruster where you're taking the dumbbell squat and pushing overhead you do any throws like medicine ball throws med things ball like that throws. rotational med yeah, ball throws yeah it could be a slam it could be an overhead it could be a rotational yeah just what you're saying so something there and then um so that takes priority in the program it's in strength block one and then we'll do that lower body push um typically maybe unilateral so some type of rear foot elevated split squat or front foot elevated split squat um, just to develop that function on single foot. Right. Single you limb. get you get both legs producing, you know, the same amount of force trying to work on any type of strength imbalance between the yes. right or left leg or, or right or left arm. Yeah. Yeah. Then we progress more into um, plyo power and we pair that with a push. So before, right, there was like the push and then the plyo. Now I've kind of separated it until we have like our speed and our push, and then we have our plyo, and then a push, and then we go into conditioning circuit. And so it kind of, it looks similar across, whether it's lower body, upper body, total body. So like on day two there, you got upper body plyo. What type of upper body plyos you like? Just like a like a plyometric push-up coming off the Those ground? Those are perfect. Those yeah. are perfect. Okay. Um, but also on the fight camp, it depends too, because their wrist is so involved. I was gonna action. say, yeah, I wonder how, how that you Might just go that. for a slam. Um, yeah, so, but. I kept I kept the plow push up in and it worked well. Um, but if you have to work around that ball slam, yeah, works great. Okay, all right. Anything else you want to uh, mention there with uh, either those strength blocks or the conditioning circuits or? Uh, conditioning circuits are kind of what you see. For me, we'll utilize some type of cardiovascular aspect. It could be a bike sprint. It could be um, a row ergometer. You might put them on a treadmill. Um, some type of cardiovascular aspect. Then we'll do upper body plyo, um, such as a med ball slam. Again, some type of plyo push-up or a bandit push-up or something similar. Um, we'll do some type of rotational movement. We'll work the posterior chain like glute bridges are great, heavy glute yeah. bridges. Um, whenever you're fatigued, that'll that'll get you um, going. Barbell um, hip thrust, things like that. Barbell hip thrust, yeah, yeah especially great. under fatigued and for time. And then some type of resistant sprint, um, uh, mainly for the output there and the intensity of movement. And then I like how you see it, you know, you start incorporating some of the Olympic lifts in there and then um again loads like what percentage is a one rep max we're working out i mean i i see how you're trying to work at all components of the yep. force velocity curve yep. so there's some days where you may like you said working at 50 percent of your one rm yeah uh or even lower do you say like down to 30 percent like 30 percent and so you're you're lifting a lighter load but trying to move it as fast, fast as possible, possible right like if you do a olympic variation like a hang jump shrug right you can use like 30 percent of yep. your one rm um for a couple of reasons, but mainly to get that high output, right? Yeah. The high intensity output. Okay. Um, if we're going heavier, I like to do it on the first day after they've had some rest, get them fresh before they go through the full training week. So that's where we'll work at 
around maybe 70 to 80 percent if we're going to do it so like maybe on on day one it's it's your heavier day and then as you progress through the week you go you lighten the load up but you're going to still be trying to move it as yep. fast as possible okay yep exactly all right you want to go to the next one let's go to the next one next slide so we are now on post fight and again, what the daily breakdown looks like after they've had that fight, beat up, yep, body is hurting, yep. <laughs> so, yeah, this looks super basic because it is right. So maybe three days max we get them in the gym. Um, the warm up is very general to specific. If there's a specific area we need to address in the warm up, um, from that mobility, flexibility, stability standpoint, and then strength. Day one, lower body push, two, upper body push, three, lower body pull. Basic, just one exercise. Um, maybe we'll do three sets. Um, kind of depends on how they're feeling, but maybe five to eight reps. Um, typically at a lighter load. So so total so total exercises like on, on day one, how many how many are you saying total? Maybe four or five exercises total. Okay. Yep. Yep. Cut that back. That makes sense after the fight. Yep. So I mean, just you're not gonna feel like you're not gonna right. feel like training. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah. Um, yeah. Cut back on the exercises, and then yeah, we kind of progress throughout the week. So from lower body to upper body to total body. Gotcha. Okay. So yeah, I see day three there. Total body. Um, yeah. Total body pull. The strength block one. The lower body pull. All right. And then I see how you've backed off the conditioning on day two. Yep. Yep. So, yeah, day right. one, we'll hit some short oxidative. Um, so, probably just let them cycle for 15 minutes or so. Yeah. If they feel up to it or jog, whatever. Almost 15. like a recovery cycle. That's yeah. It. Just, just get recovery. you moving, get the blood circulating, get it, it. flowing. Yeah. Day two, completely off. And then day three, long oxidative, maybe 30 minutes or so. And then We'll keep doing that until we figure out the next fight date um, and develop yeah. a plan. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. We'll go to the next one. So we've kind of, you know, talked a little bit about, you know, your work in the Jack Athletic Performance Lab. Um, I think if anybody has questions, you know, your contact information is there. Um, I don't know. You want to talk about some of your social social media there or anything any other ways people can reach out to you sure so email is there and then for our jayhawk athletic performance lab we have um kind of our usernames and apps there for facebook twitter or x instagram linkedin if y'all are interested in following us um or if you have questions reach out that way yeah there's yeah. a lot of cool stuff going on in the jack athletic performance lab and not only just like I said, you're, you're doing research in, in other areas too. And I know we'll have another episode where we, we talk about some of that. So, um, anything else you want to add? I think that's all I got. That's it. That's all I have. Just all keep right. the main thing, the main thing and come up with a plan. Make sure that we're in the people. Remember that we're in the people business and yeah, it'll all work out. And it's the kiss method, right? Keep it simple. Stupid. That's it. Yeah. yeah. So how can people contact you if you have questions about strength and conditioning, uh, mixed martial arts, your research, teaching or what's going on in the Jayhawk Athletic Performance Lab? The best way to contact me is via email at quincy.johnson at ku.edu. Other ways to contact me are via social media, whether it's X or whether it's Instagram at Quincy Johnson PhD. Um, and then of course, by phone, if they would like to call, they can contact me at 785-864-1944. All right, and if you have questions for me about the KU exercise science program, send an email to jtaylor at ku.edu or call 913-897-8516. And from one bald-headed doc to another, thanks for watching today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it.